he's tackling the book of Titus. It's three chapters, and he's asked me this morning to, to read all three chapters with you. And so join with me as we open the word of God to Titus chapter 1. Hear the word of the Lord where he says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching, which I have been entrusted by the commander of our Lord God and Savior. To Titus, my, two, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers, not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They, they must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and the unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may, not, may be put to shame, having nothing having nothing evil to say about us. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, to show perfect courtesy towards all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hating by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration, the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want to insist on these things, so that those who have believed, believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. 
These things are excellent and profitable for people, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped, sinful, he is self-condemned. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best speed, Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing, and let our people learn to devote themselves to good works, so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. And who are with me, send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. I invite you to join me in a word of prayer. God, you are the God of life. Your word brings life. And we all stand in need to hear from you this morning. We want you to speak to us. You have given me the privilege to be the one you speak through this morning. I pray you would help me to do so full reliance on who you are. Bless your people through your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So growing up in the 90s, there was this ad by Toyota that became popular. To be honest, I don't remember what car was being marketed at the time. I only remember the slogan that rang at the end. Yoi seihin, yoi kangai. Good thinking, good products. See, during the recalls and public disapproval Toyota was facing, the automobile giant had to re-examine their philosophy and let that determine how they would face the issues they were facing. See, Toyota's management understood that excellence doesn't just happen by accident. It needed a solid foundation. You have good thinking, you get good products. Well, today we, we are going to be taking a bird's eye view of the letter of Titus. We are going to look at the big picture here and see what we can learn from it. If we had to summarize the message of Titus, it would be something like this protect and proclaim sound teaching, which leads to sound living. See, long before Toyota came along, the Apostle Paul knew that the battle begins in the mind, since that's what orders our actions and how we live our lives. So if I could take the liberty to remix Toyota's slogan for our purposes, it would be, Yoi Oshie, Yoi Kurashi, good teaching, good living. Paul's charge to, Timothy, to Titus to protect and proclaim sound teaching is instructive for us today, too. Here is the main takeaway we are going to be thinking about. What you believe shapes how you behave. See, the Bible isn't concerned with self-help or the power of positive thinking. The reality is everyone is a theologian. Even the most hardened atheist has a worldview that influences uh, how they behave. And if that's true for the atheist, it's definitely true for the Christian too. What you believe shapes how you behave. So our lessons for today would be that we need to be a people who are anchored with God's grace, aligned with godly living, and active with good works. So to begin, here is a back, some background information for the letter we're looking at. This letter was written by Paul, who was an apostle. That basically means he had a special role in the life of the church, chosen by Jesus to spread the gospel and to help build the church. He went through different missionary journeys, taking the gospel out into the known world at the time, planting churches. 
And this letter was written by Paul to a man named Titus, who he calls his true child in the common faith. Titus was a trusted co-worker of Paul, and the two of them had apparently traveled together to the Greek island of Crete for ministry. And as Paul was moving on from Crete, Titus was charged to stay behind and finish up their work. So what was Titus's important task? Protect and proclaim sound teaching, which leads to sound living. We read in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 5, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Part of Titus's job was to protect sound doctrine in the region of Crete by appointing qualified men who don't just talk the talk, but they also walk the walk. This is why Paul gives him a list of character qualities to look out for, like being hospitable, a lover of good, not arrogant. And then he says to him in chapter 1, verse 9, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Those appointed as elders in the church must have a handle on sound doctrine. Apparently, there are approximately 4,000 religions and faith groups in the world. Those who are being appointed to, as elders, are they expected to know every single religion and know the 10,000 gods out there? I don't think so. These men only needed to know the one true God who has revealed himself in his word and through his son, Jesus Christ. But why the emphasis on character and sound teaching for the leaders of the church in Crete? Why do we need that emphasis in our churches today? Because like Crete, uh, like the culture today, the culture of Crete back then was pretty bad. See, influences were doing damage to the church from within with bad teaching and bad living. Paul says in verse, verses 10 and 11 of chapter 1, For they, there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced, since they are upset in whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. There was damage happening from within the church. But the culture they lived in itself was bad as well. In verses 12 to 13, Paul quotes Epimenides, an ancient author and poet of Crete, and he says this. He says, one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. The so-called leaders were leading the churches astray. And even the believers themselves were so surrounded by their Cretan culture that they needed to be instructed on how to live. This was what Titus was supposed to do, protect and proclaim sound teaching, appoint elders who know sound doctrine and live it out, and he himself was meant to model this for them. So that's the background of this letter. Now let's think about our first lesson here. We need to be a people who are anchored with God's grace. As Mark read through the letter for us, you might have noticed there are a lot of instructions here. But before we get to those, we need to remind ourselves that what you believe shapes how you behave. Paul says in chapter 2, verse 1, But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Sound basically means healthy or true. Unlike the false teachers of Crete, Titus is to teach what accords with sound doctrine, to teach things that are suitable, fitting, and appropriate expressions of sound teaching. In other words, his teaching should illustrate the good living that good teaching brings about. This is how you ought to behave based on what you profess to believe. So if sound teaching is the solution to the problem in Crete, then the question is, what is it? As you read through the letter to Titus, 
there are two beautiful expressions of the Christian faith. It's found in chapter 2, verses 11 to 14, and chapter 3, verses 3 to 7. They are expressions of the same reason and motivation that Paul gives behind his instructions. But since we're only passing through Titus, as it, as it were, we'll only focus on one of them. But I would encourage you to take time and meditate on these uh, both when you can. So let's think together of what Paul writes in uh, Titus 2, 11 to 14. After giving instructions on how the believers uh, should live, in verses 11 to 14, he gives the reasons and motivation for their obedience. See, if what you believe shapes how you behave, then these verses are vital for us. Chapter 2, verse 11, Paul says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Or like the song we sang before the break says, The grace of God has reached for me. Grace, the divine unmerited favor of God, not because of the reason that we did anything special or that we are good or deserving, he moved toward us sinners out of his own goodness and kindness. See, the Christians in Crete were no better than their neighbors, and the truth is, church, neither are we. That is the testimony of the Bible. For example, in Ephesians 2, Paul says about everyone that we all were dead in sin. We all were disobedient towards him. We all followed our passions, but perhaps one of the most precious words in the Bible. But God, rich in mercy, great in love, saved us by his grace. Christian, this should lead you to humility. God's grace is the only difference here, not your morality, not your self-righteousness, and certainly not your so-called good works. Then Paul goes on to say in verse 12 that the grace of God has appeared, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. See, the grace of God brought, that brought us salvation also brings sanctification. It makes us holy. The grace of God isn't a free pass to do whatever you want and to keep on sinning. Paul says in Romans 6, what shall we say then? Are we continue to sin that grace may abound? By no means, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Christian, the grace of God should lead you to holiness. Paul tells us that it trains us it trains us to put away the sins we were used to or known for and trains us to live godly and righteously in this present age. And then as we do this, he says in verse 13, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We sang about this earlier. What a foretaste of deliverance. How unwavering our hope. Christ in power, resurrected as we will be when he comes. Church, we have a blessed hope. The resurrected Jesus is coming back in glory. Jesus himself says of his coming in Matthew 24, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. But there's something else in verse 13 that we read. I don't know if you caught that. He says, we are waiting for the appearance of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is an explicit expression of the deity of Christ. Jesus is not just a man, not just a prophet. He's not an angel. He's not a created being. He is true God of true God. And as Paul carries on, he says in, in verse 14, 
that this Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness. See, the grace of God is freely given, but it doesn't mean it's free. It costs the life of the very Son of God, dying for sinners to make us free. And then he says, Jesus gave himself for us uh, to redeem us and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Jesus gave himself for a purpose, to purchase and to purify a people for his own possession. It reminds me of Galatians 2.20 when Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Christian, this is your identity. You are no longer yours. You are Christ's when you trust in him. We have taken some time to slow down here because this is vital. What you believe shapes how you behave. We need to be anchored with God's grace. Because the reality is, if your actions and your living are not motivated by your convictions, they become burdensome, empty, and unsustainable. One of the most miserable things you can do is to try to live like a Christian when you aren't one. It is only possible by the grace of God. And I think parents in the church especially need to be mindful of this. See, if we emphasize behavior before belief, we end up raising children who think they're Christians just because their parents are. But listen, no one is born a Christian. We need to do evangelism to our kids before we do discipleship. You train them up by showing them who God is, what sin is, what Jesus has done. And you pray that they would know the grace of God in their lives. The world looks at Christians with disdain. They see the behavior, but they do not have the belief, so it looks weird to them. It doesn't make sense. And the Apostle Paul agrees. See, he says in 1 Corinthians 15, if our faith isn't true, if the resurrection didn't happen, then of all people, we are to be pitied. We might as well eat and drink for tomorrow we die. So as you listen to this, ask yourself, do I really believe this? Do I really believe that I am not the final authority over my own life, but I am accountable to the holy God who made me and thereby guilty of judgment because of my sin? Do I really believe that a way to be made right with God has been provided, not because I did anything to deserve it, but because God really is that good, kind, and merciful? Do I really believe that this same Jesus who died for my sins will come back for his people and as one of them, I am meant to live today in a way that brings him glory? Do I really believe that I am not only saved by grace, but sanctified by grace and strengthened by grace to do all that he commands? Friend, if you are here and you are not a Christian, I want you to know that good living without first believing in good teaching isn't possible. You don't need to try to live a perfect life in hopes that God will accept you. That would be miserable and impossible. The grace of God has appeared. Bring in salvation to all people. All you need to do is take God at his word. Christ died for our sins and was raised. Trust in him and you will be saved. That is the gospel. Believe it. Believe him. He is the God who doesn't lie. That's what Paul says at the start of this letter. For my Christian brothers and sisters, we need to make sure that we remain anchored with God's grace. Are you struggling with a certain sin? 
Do you want to grow in your spiritual maturity? There are practical steps you need to take, that's true, but first, you need to check what you believe. Reflect on the gospel daily. Spend time in God's word. Pray for those who preach and teach in the church regularly because if what you believe shapes how you behave, then you need to make sure that what you are believing is sound. Remember, good teaching, good living. If what we believe, if we believe that we have been saved by grace, called to be his people and to live for him, then the next thing we learn is that we need to be aligned with godly living. You might have heard this illustration before, you know, the one about the fish. So there's this older fish who swims by two younger fish and he says, hey guys, how's the water? And then the two fish swim, swim away for a while, and then one of them stops and looks to the other and says, what's water? The believers in Crete were swimming in the dangerous currents of their culture. The reputation of people from Crete was so bad that there was a Greek word for liar that was named after them. That's pretty bad. <laughs> Like those fish, it's easy to become desensitized to something you're exposed to every day, isn't it? And I wonder what the Apostle Paul would say about the so-called progressive and inclusive culture of Canada today. I wonder if we've been swimming in the current for so long that we've developed blind spots to our culture and we ask ourselves, what culture? What sin? But that might be a sermon for another day. As the tides of the culture is going against sound teaching, Christians are called to be countercultural. If you are a Christian, you're called to live in a way that is consistent with the gospel truths you profess to believe. It won't be easy. You might get picked on and called names like weird or old fashioned. And you might not get as far as your uh, peers who have less talent and drive than you do, but you know what? Godly living is all about living for God's glory, not yours. Paul shows us this in this letter. For example, negatively, he says in chapter 1, verse 16, that they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. And positively, he says Christians should live a certain way because chapter 2, verse 5, he says uh, that the word of God may not be reviled. And again, in chapter 2, verse 10, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. This reminds me of what Peter says in his letter. He says, but you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That's what you are. Now, this is the reason that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. But here's the thing. Even when we believe the fundamentals of our faith that is found in the gospel, we still need help figuring out what that looks like on the day to day. So how do we make sure that what we believe is shaping how we behave? We need someone to show us what it looks like. Enter discipleship. I personally have seen godly parents who look, uh, godly parents who model what it looks like to pursue family devotions and seek to raise up their children in the fear of the Lord despite their failures and weaknesses. And I have witnessed godly brothers and sisters worship the Lord in the midst of suffering, declaring that God is still good even when their circumstances are not. We live in a broken world, friends. And there are many religions and ideologies that stand against the truth of God and his son, Jesus Christ. And we can help one another as the body of Christ by modeling well what following Jesus looks like in the here and now as we hold on to the already but not yet hope of eternal life. 
Are you thinking of discipleship now? I hope you are. This letter provides us a good place to start. See, Paul gives snapshots of what godly living looks like for Christians in different life stages and social standings. But this doesn't mean that all Christian men, women, aunties, uncles, and parents need to look the same, or that, I don't know, there's only one way to vote as a Christian. It would be a mistake for those in discipling relationships to basically try to turn those they are discipling into another version of themselves. I mean, can you imagine if next week, Pastor Mark comes in here with like five other dudes dressed the same, same haircut and everything? <laughs> I'm imagining that now. My imagination's running, running wild in my head. Um, listen, Christian brother, Christian sister, you're probably great. You're probably a great guy or great gal once people get to know you. But newsflash, the world doesn't need another you-like person. It needs another Christ-like person. What Paul is calling for here aren't cookie-cutter Christians, but convictional, consistent Christians who know what they believe and let it shape how they behave. They ask themselves questions like these. What is God calling me to in my home as a husband or father? How can I teach those younger than me who are struggling about God's goodness and faithfulness because I have been through some things in my life? What attitude would I go to work with this week if I knew that I was representing Jesus himself in whatever I do? How do I help my daughter in the faith adorn the gospel in her marriage? The answers to these questions might look different for different people because we all have different circumstances, but the conviction to live like Christ and for Christ should be constant for us. As those who are anchored with God's grace, we need to be aligned with godly living. So the question is, does how you behave reflect what you believe? Is the good teaching you receive in the church day in and day out being translated into godly living, or is there a mix-up somewhere? Here are some questions for you to reflect on and consider. If I believe in eternal life from a God who doesn't lie, then am I still trying to live my best life now? If I believe that I am washed and cleansed from my sins, then am I still holding on to them? If I say I am Christ's possession, then am I still living to please men or God? Remember, the fake followers in Crete professed to know God, but denied him by their works. How they behaved revealed what they truly believed. In other words, their confessional theology didn't line up with their functional or practical theology. We need to be anchored with God's grace. That is the motivation and means by which we can live the Christian life. But then we need to be aligned with godly living. It's not enough to, name, to claim the name of Christian. Your life has to affirm it. It's like that saying goes, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. I hope I didn't just make some of you hungry there. The last lesson for, for, for us to learn from this quick, quick look at the letter to Titus is that if what you believe shapes how you behave, then we need to be active with good works. Paul's emphasis on good works is unmistakable in the letter. In chapter 2, verse 7, he says that Titus is to show himself in all respects to be a model of good works. In, in chapter 3, verse 8, he says that the believers are to devote themselves to good works. In chapter 2, verse 14, that we looked at earlier, we read that Jesus gave himself to redeem us from all lawlessness. He saved us from our lawless deeds to make us his people who are zealous for good deeds. 
This reminds me again of what Paul writes in Ephesians 2. He says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Created for good works. See, this letter to Titus and the rest of the Bible is very clear on this point. We are not saved by good works, but we are saved for good works. An authentic faith is an active faith. This is why towards the end of the letter, Paul says in chapter 3, verse 14, and let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. So what does this mean? It means you are expected to get involved. There are no bench warmers on God's team. We all have different roles to play, but we all have a role to play. So I wonder, what could this look like in the context of our church? Well, here are some examples. We're looking for people who are able and willing to give rides to church and from church on Sundays. You can get involved. There's a sign-up sheet right over there. The church potluck is coming up in two weeks. How can you intentionally contribute or serve the church in that gathering? We need people to help set up and clean up the church on Sundays. You can get involved that way. The PCC relay is coming up. How can you get involved or support such an important cause in the city? As I tell you these things, please remember you are not saved by good works. You are saved by grace. Trying to earn God's favor is like trying to fill the ocean with your sweat. It's never going to happen. But if you believe that you have been redeemed by Jesus and you are one of his own, then you know that you are called to be a part of a people who are zealous, eager for good works. But I know someone might hear this and roll their eyes and sigh thinking, great. More things for me to do. Friend, listen, I am less concerned about telling you what you should do. I am more concerned in telling you who you are called to be. If you know who God is, if you know what your sin means, if you know who Jesus is and what he has done to redeem you, to cleanse you, to claim you as his own, then who you're called to be will naturally flow out in what you do. I hope our time this morning has grown your interest in this beautiful letter from the Apostle Paul. What you believe shapes how you behave. As those who claim the name of Christ, we need to be a people who are anchored with God's grace, knowing how we are saved knowing how we are able to be, to be obedient. We need to be a people who are aligned with godly living. We can't just say we are Christians. We need to live it. And we need to be a people who are active with good works, declaring God is good and doing good works for his glory. The more we drink deeply of the riches of God's word, the more we will become who we have been made to be in Christ Jesus. Remember, yoi oshie, yoi kurashi, good teaching, good living. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we stand as those who are debtors of grace. You have saved us in amazing ways when we put our faith in Jesus, not because of anything we did, but because you are that good, kind, and merciful. We thank you for sending your son for us. We thank you for your spirit who uh, brings about regeneration and enables us to obey. Oh, Father, we pray you would use your word this morning to stir our hearts to faith. We pray especially for those who don't know you. Oh, God, would you please be merciful to them? 
Open their eyes to see their need for a Savior. Help them to see that they could never earn your grace. It is freely given in Jesus. And those of us who do know Jesus, help us, O Lord, to live out our identity, living in a godly way, active with good works. Lord, we lay our lives before you. Please use them for your glory. Our hands, our feet, our words, our minds, our talents and gifts, they are all from you. Please take them and use them for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Church.